It is once again time for the Emissary Publishing Podcast. I'm Jason Todd with my co-host, friend, and colleague, Paul Edwards. And today, Curtis Honeycutt is joining us. But, Paul, welcome. Good to have you here. Great to be here, Jay. Great to be with you again. And uh, excited to, to chat with Curtis here. Uh, Curtis and I uh, belong to a, a, a mastermind group together, but uh, actually don't know each other very well. So this is kind of flying a little blind for both of us. We're going to dig in. We're going to get to know him and a little bit about uh, his background, as well as the, <clears throat> the his latest book, which is called The E-Word. And we're going to talk. I'm. Uh, this is kind of curious for me. I'm. I'm sort of following your lead on this. We're gonna. But I. But I think I. I know where you're headed with it. We're gonna talk about the message that matters now. Um, and uh, you know, just a little bit that you were saying about that. You know, what used to matter no longer matters, or in some cases, it mattered, and we've lost sight of that, and we need to get back to it. Yeah, I love going into conversations like this where we're a little bit blind, because it removes a bit of presumption about where we should end up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and I, and I think that's so important when we get people with differing backgrounds, experiences, goals, dreams, hopes together <laughs> in the same room, or in this case, you know, virtual environment, because each of our understandings then contribute to, uh, I can't remember what the author is, but somebody's quoted this idea of the pool of shared meaning mm -hmm. where, what is most relevant between all of us? We have the opportunity to put that into the pool of shared meaning, then look at it and then uh, pull it out, uh, kind of extract the essence of, like in this topic, what matters now. So let's bring Curtis in to this conversation. Curtis, welcome, man. Thank you so much. I'm excited like to that have hat. the conversation. Thank you. It's a running hat. I got it actually running with a guy. Um, from the the mastermind we belong to he kicked yeah. my butt and i got a hat to go run a marathon in the mountains and yeah so this hat reminds me of suffering oh man that's deep <laughs> uh, dude he smashed me he he embarrassed me he's a lot older than me and i was like i'll be fine but he was so we ended up doing 29 miles in the appalachian appalachian whatever uh trail on the Appalachian Mountains. It was a training run for him. It was like my peak, my pinnacle. It was just his training run on the way to a hundred mile race. So wow. He made me look stupid. Yeah. Oh wow. So it's my Sasquatch I, hat. Well I really like the juxtaposition of a fun hat that reminds you of suffering. That's it, man. <laughs> I think that's probably relevant to the conversation today in this idea <laughs> of what what matters now. I love the how you talk about this idea, you know, that that run was a training run for him, but for you, it was the pinnacle. And uh, so maybe launch us, launch us off. Tell <laughs> us about your, tell, tell us about your book and why we're having this discussion today. Uh, yeah. So um, the, the, the book with, that we, that we wrote, it's called the E word and we ended up writing it. It was during COVID. It was me. And at the time uh, my senior pastor. So a little bit of background. We, uh, me and my wife met in Australia in 2015. We were both there for the year. And then when we came back, um, I had stopped with business and we started a church, uh, planted a church through this network. And then I was doing leadership development for the rest of the churches in the network. And um, when COVID hit and we had a bit of time, we were talking about what was happening inside of society, my senior pastor and I, and we're both obsessed with history. So we're just always, every time we have conversations, it's digging into new pieces of history and we love it. So through those conversations, it just kind of started to form. And we're like, you know, he's written books. I'd written a book. It's like, let's just, we need to write this. Um, and it essentially goes from the big topic and the big idea inside of the books called the E word and evangelism from how do you take, uh, uh, what was once a movement that became an institution and allow it to become a movement once again. So the book starts with kind of some case studies from everything from even like Mao in terrible movements to healthy movements, all the way down to, um, I have a story of personal evangelism with um, the way that I ended up coming to Christ through a friend that had leukemia. Mm. So that's, that's, I guess, the E word in essence. Mm. So I hear... <clears throat> I'm hearing right off the bat that I think 
and, and well, I, and I mean, you know, just by the use of the word evangelism and the associations that I make when I hear that word, um, I'm hearing probably more of a, probably a little bit of both of those two options we talked about at the outset, Jason. One of them is, you know, that uh, something no longer works. Mm. And the other is that something did work and we've lost sight of it and we need to go back to it. And I think the thing that no longer works, probably, Curtis, if I'm going to jump ahead of you just a little bit here, is the associations that most of us in the West would make with a word like evangelism. Yeah. Uh, think of people, you know, with bullhorns saying, repent for the end is near, thou shalt die and burn in hell, right? And, the, you know, at the sporting events with the megaphones and all that. And then there's this more ancient definition of it that had nothing whatsoever to do with that mm. and everything to do with much of what propels all of us forward. I've certainly seen uh, just in everyday <coughs> uh, relationships, particularly relationships focused on, uh, on, on building and, um, uh, and moving life forward, whether it's in the marketplace or it's in, uh, you know, just in marriages and in relationships based on faith, uh, which are very, you know, th that's a very, that's a very far cry from uh, the guy with the bullhorn. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you know, the, <laughs> well, not to get philosophical here, there, there is a role from time to time for the guy with the bullhorn. I don't want to, uh, you know, some people that's if, if like, if God asks someone to do that, I don't want to get in his way, but I can't help observing how ineffective it is, how people just shuffle past it and completely ignore it, which is what intrigues me to, you know, to hear how you and your co-author, you know, redefine this and, and what you dug into, what kind of stories were, uh, helpful in, in reframing this. I got yelled at by a bullhorn guy in Coronado, California. So, uh, my family and I, we, uh, my wife and at the time, two kids, we sold all our stuff and hopped into a fifth wheel and went across the country. Paul, I think you know this. And, um, as we went across the country, we ended up in Southern California and I was out there with a friend of mine, Ryan Delamater, who runs an organization called Ocean Water. And there are 45 of these intentionally small churches and they don't like all the money just goes to mission. So he has his doctorate in water policy, which is a thing I didn't know. Uh, <laughs> but they'll start churches in jujitsu gyms. They call them grapple chapel. They choke each other out and then they like they pray and study scripture and then they go do stuff for people. And it's fantastic. But like the money goes to these water projects. So right. I went out there to go spend time with him to help with some church planting stuff. And then people like Ralph Moore out there, who's since the 60s started 2,600 churches across the world. 2,600. Like mm. unbelievable. That whole Jesus Revolution movie, he was a church planter in Southern California during that time. But rather than making a big church, he made a whole bunch of them. So it was insane. But I was actually the bullhorn guy. I was in Coronado and I was walking and I had an ACDC shirt on. <laughs> I'm faster, <laughs> you know, but I, was, I liked the colors and they have some fun songs. Uh, but I was walking and there's the bullhorn guy in Coronado was just yelling at me like, you don't need ACDC. Ah, and I'm just like, all right, cool, man. <laughs> so, but there's like, there's, there's a plate, but that's, I think that's the point, right? The, the point is if we don't pay attention to the environment that we're in, then we're completely missing it because we're missing the one thing that we're supposed to do, which is the focus on the other people. We're yeah. focused on what we want to say or what it is we think we want to do. So like, as I, all of this, a lot of it in preparation for us was going to Sweden, Sweden, like the U S is post Christian, right? Sweden's post secular. Yeah. Here, Sweden's post secular. So now they're, they're past the point of for a long time, they've been, post-Christian, not okay. interested in Christianity. So you have this thing that kind of happens where it's like people are violently opposed, like they're just completely pissed off about the idea of Christianity and how could you, or they're just like, oh man, this is cool. And then you have some of the middle people that are like, yeah, I'll show up. But then in a post-Christian culture, it's indifference. It's yeah. like, no. And I, I told you guys before we hopped on here, there was this statistic 
Um, I think this guy was uh, Paul Robinson, something Robinson. Um, but it was 95% of Swedes were a member of the Church of Sweden. Less than eight yeah. percent believed in Jesus. Yeah. So it's like it's it's become this thing, or it's like the Easter Bunny. It's just they're indifferent towards it. So if I go to Sweden and I just try to do what I did, our church was growing really fast back in Maryland. So we had the, the things were going well. Mm -hmm. But if I try to do that in Sweden, like you send out flyers, you do some stuff on Facebook, you start, try to serve the community, it's not going to work. Life is no. built around a table. You have to understand the culture. You have to understand the people. I'm studying the language. I'm, you have to dig in. So if I'm not paying attention to what's actually happening in Sweden, and I just go and bring my own, then I'm like, ah, oh, they don't want to hear anything. And I complain about it, but I'm not actually getting to know them. I'm doing the opposite of what Jesus did. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, you didn't ask for any of that, but I figured. Well, but it is, I mean, again, that <clears throat> in, in a way, I, I didn't have to because we're talking about what is the message that matters now? Mm. Not the one that, mat that, that mattered six months ago when you were doing it in Maryland. Yeah. Right. And not the one that mattered six years ago when you were doing whatever you were doing then. Yeah. <clears throat> the, me the message that matters now is where you're headed and it's going to be a different one. Yeah. No question about it. Yeah. One of the things that comes to my mind is just this, phrase that's been sitting in my head for many months now that life is not designed to be optimized and it seems that we as particularly westerners in the united states the church in the united states uh we tend to create um optimal uh, scenarios productions we measure them. We know how many people are coming through the door. We know how many people are giving. We know what they're giving to. Uh, and we treat, we treat these messages, this delivery of the message in the same way we would be selling televisions hmm. or cars yeah. or co cups of coffee. And when we look at the relationships that matter the most to us, they are far from optimal. Hmm. They are riddled with holes. Get a family around a table and one person's got something against this person for the next decade. And then this kind of comes back around and, you know, and then they have this heart to heart and it's up and it's down and it's in and out sideways. And somebody looked at somebody differently and I can't believe they did this. And then it's resolved. And it's, it, it's, it just seems to me that the, the bullhorn to the masses, we have to now measure it is a is a big departure from sitting around a table and like you talk about really getting to know people in a an environment that's not efficient it's not optimal it's just life we are just allowing each other to be and as we live out whatever that message is in our own lives then we have that opportunity to to converse yeah. with another person and it becomes very personal and very meaningful and super inefficient. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. This, for me, it's you know, discipleship is replication of a life lived. It's like, it's me. That's why there was a, a book called um, uh, the master plan of evangelism. And the whole idea was like grand scale movement of Christianity is focused on the roots and the depth of the 12. And so for us, it's the roots and the depth of the family and the oikos and the people that are closest to us. So if I'm trying to, there's this, okay. Um, I have to say this in a way to where it uh, has confidentiality. So there was, a, there was a guy that showed up to a church campus and this guy was um, really beat up, um, just dirty. You know, he's, he's sitting there smoking and, um, just clothes ripped up. And uh, one of my friends who was a pastor was there and came out and was sitting there talking to him. And I had seen them talking and walked by, said hi. And afterwards he said, my pastor friend pulled me aside and said, do you know who that was? And my pastor friend, who's older guy, he's in his 60s, 70s. Um, and I said, no. And 
he said there was a there was a, a, a denominational movement that happened in the area that we were in. And he said, you know, that denomination? I said, yeah. He said, the guy that started that here? I said, yeah. He said, that was his son. Mm. Now, I don't know the full story. That guy could have just been a jerk and run away from home and his dad could have been great. But for me, I look at that and I'm saying, for me, that's failure. Because for me, if I can start this grand scale thing, but something doesn't pour out of me to where, because something should bleed out of me to where my, my kids and the people that knew me best and my wife and my, it should be able to bleed out of them where there's this generational infection that starts to happen. Like it was it, one of the case studies that we ended up finding in the book um, that we wrote about was William Wilberforce. I was reading Eric Metaxas's book on William Wilberforce. And if you're not familiar with him, he, uh, he's the one that got slavery abolished um, from England. He was the first one to take it to parliament and, and got everything passed uh, just before his death. And um, so this grand scale thing that he got done, right? Well, in Wilbur, I mean, in uh, Metaxas's book, he breezed over this point that I became obsessed with. Uh, he wrote about Wilberforce had these things that he called launchers. And what a launcher was, was let's say, Paul, I know you love nice microphones. Mm -hmm. So I would have a list of people. William Wilberforce had lists of people. One of the lists was people that he knew were already saved. And there were prayer requests. Like, I'm going to pray for Jason's family, or I'm going to pray for whatever it is. And then for Paul, let's say, Paul, you're unsaved. I have you on this other list. And next to your name, I have microphones. And I'm going to have a sentence or two next to it on how I can take the topic of microphones, something you are in love with and excited about, and turn it into a conversation around the idea of eternity. So it was this guy that got this grand scale thing done. But for me, I see the power of what he actually got done was what he did outside of when he was on a stage or when he was you know, writing documents. It was this, <coughs> the power and the energy when what he did, it came from his personal discipline and it came mm -hmm. from his focus and his passion for the individuals. And in that, he understood the individuals and it made him even more effective on the bigger scale. Yeah. Yeah. He was, uh, well, the, the, from what I'm hearing there, it sounds like he was <clears throat> paying attention to details about people's lives. Yeah. And in a, in a healthy way, leveraging his knowledge of that to carry the, the culture that he built in a direction. Yeah. And, <clears throat> Boy, you know, I learned so much about that, Curtis, because the uh, the 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 assumptions that I had about what it meant to evangelize and what it meant to be an ambassador for the kingdom through the conventional church model of the last thirty years or so. Uh, just to be honest, I, I couldn't find a way to make them work. It wasn't, it wasn't effective. It wasn't, it might have been effective at one point. It had stopped, it had ceased to be as I started to become involved in it. But it, another thing happened, and that was that uh, a dream I had of being in broadcasting, right? Mm. You talk about having a, a bullhorn and talking to an awful lot of people failed. And so I was sort of uh, politely forced into the marketplace. And the marketplace, of course, uh, nobody knows how much you, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And one of the skill sets that I had at my disposal as I learned to build relationships and network was to make a note of details of the, the, the people shared with me and then connect them with other people who I knew who could solve the problem or had the same problem or needed what they offered and could, you know, and, uh, I just like, I, I remember seeing all this magic happen and thinking to myself, you know, I'm doing way more evangelism hmm. out here in the, in the free market than I ever did. Uh, just trying to do it, you know, 
church style. And the reason is I'm, I'm, I don't want to say I'm being forced. It's not like I'm like callous and indifferent, but I just, it wasn't my habit to focus on others' needs and then put, put two and two together. But I learned it. I had to. And then I got these wonderful opportunities where people noticed the difference of interacting with me and said, you know, what's behind all this? And I said, well, it's, it, it's what I feel a, a, a person ought to do. It's I'm driven by conviction. It's the, it's the God I worship, you know, it's, it's how I feel business should be done. And even if they were not particularly <clears throat> subscribed to the same belief, uh, they, they couldn't argue with it. They couldn't disrespect it or vomit on it or say, Ugh, you know, don't want anything to do with that. They just sort of had to take it in because it was beneficial and demonstrated sincere care for them without any obligation. You know, this is not like I need a collection or, you know, I need a decision for Christ today type of thing. Um, it's just being, being genuine and following through and being amazed at the, at the return on such a simple investment. And it's, and then when those opportunity comes, it's also having, it's having, it's having the testimonies and having the stories because I'll, I'll never forget. So when I was in Australia, there was this, this lady. So I was, you know, I didn't grow up necessarily in church. I grew up chasing girls and smoking a lot of weed. And then when I ended up getting saved, I was actually on my best friend's basement floor when he was in bed, sick with leukemia. And I, anyway, so I, it's a story for another time. But uh, a couple of years later, I'm in Australia and I saw this lady who's freaking terrifying. First person I ever saw heal somebody when I was like, yeah, it's probably like a biblical thing, um, you know, back in the day. And I, I watched her heal somebody, freaked me out and freaked the girl out that she healed too. And, uh, but she's become one of my greatest mentors because she's so kind, so humble, but she's lived a lot of life. She mm. was actually during um, uh, the beginning of the Ukraine thing. She's like almost 80 years old or maybe 80. I don't know. And she was outside Ukraine, like <laughs> baptizing people as they were getting them out of Ukraine. Like at 80, she baptized somebody in her bathtub. But I'll never forget. I was every quarter at least maybe twice I have a call with her and I just catch up with her and she asks questions. I ask questions, but I always try to have like one significant question that I really want the answer to. And the, this one conversation, I said, what is the, like, what is the, the greatest time in your life where like God moved the most and the strongest and the most powerful. And she thought for a second and she was like last week and just starts telling me this story of something that God did last week, like completely ignored my question, but didn't mm -hmm. like completely blew me off for what she knew what I was asking, but she's like, yeah, but I'm not there right now. I'm here. Let me tell you what he's doing now. Yeah. And it's like, when we have the chance to actually share, I can tell you story after story after story of the last month. Some of them are big things that sound awesome and cool, but if we're living in faith and we're focused, and what's inevitably going to happen is as we're pursuing him, we are going to see things in our lives. And as we see those things, we can debate on things theologically, but you can't debate me on my story. You yeah. can't debate me on my experience. And that's, I think it's so powerful to be able to just have the stories of what God's doing. But typically we never give him a chance to do anything because we're not willing to actually risk or step out and we're not even asking his opinion anyway one of my mentors recently just said uh, the holy spirit he said i found the holy spirit is highly opinionated uh we just don't ask him we just never ask so we neglect to be able to hear and then to obey to shema right that word shema it's it's to listen to focus and to obey there wasn't a separate word for it no so, yeah yeah no, and 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 on, and on top of that, <clears throat> um, one of the things that I've learned to do in in is to recognize that the the small things are miracles too, mm -hmm. right? We don't regard it as a miracle that water flows because we've seen it every day our entire lives, 
But who told water to flow? Mm -hmm. Not you and me. Not Jason. Maybe Jason. I don't know. Maybe. You don't know that, Paul. I don't know. That. That's true. Well, let, <laughs> it reminds me of a LinkedIn post I saw today. Uh, some some guy. I'll butcher it a little bit. I don't remember the exact details, but it went something like, "Hey, you know, how do you, how do you, uh, how do you keep the best long term track of prospects?" And um, or how do you how do you how do you stay in contact with prospects or something? I don't know what it is. And however he phrased it, what the thought came to my mind is that you treat them like people, mm. because nobody wants to be prospect. Like yeah. I frankly hate it. Like I could use your product or service, your message, but if you treat me like a prospect, I'm probably going to blow you off because I want to be known on some level. And on some level, I also don't want to be known just because that's sort of human nature, right? Yeah. Want to be known, don't want to be known, kind of, we kind of skate in the middle of that, which is the, I think the, what we're talking about this idea of, you know, you got this evangelism, you got this discipleship, it's the, I'm treating you like prospect versus I'm treating you like a person. And uh, if this prospecting, if you, if you blow me off on this prospecting thing, no harm, no foul, it's totally fine. Uh, whereas that would be a totally different experience if you're having dinner with me and then you're just like, you just got up <laughs> quietly or, and walked out, <laughs> everybody be like, what, what, what is happening here? It enables us to this idea. I think of, of being so disconnected from one, one another enables us to be anonymous, enables us to be, uh, float in and out, enables us to sit in a position where we're never really known. And I'm not certain that's good for us. And certainly when we're talking about replication of life or uh, belief systems or working out of belief systems, like you talk about mentorship, mentorship is not done uh, when you are disconnected from somebody because no. that mentor can't know who you are or where you're at now. And you can't really connect with, the, I think the, the, the richness and the energy and the reasoning for how that mentor came to whatever they are, you know, whatever their life, wherever their life is at right now, you can't really know that from a distance. You have to be right up on it, especially perhaps in a, you know, digital world like this, where, you know, we're sitting in three different states having a conversation about a, a, about a topic that necessitates face-to-face, one-on-one connection with a person over time. I mean, that's this is new territory in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, and and that's why I like the idea of what you're talking about is is the the uh, sm smaller this kind of the 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 uh, by term in terms of quantity, quant you know, quality versus quantity you know, a, a person who plants 2,600 churches, they're all probably small and they're all interconnected and they all, you know, every, people know each other. You know, I've gone to church with 80 people and I've gone to church with 5,000. It is a vastly different experience. Yeah. Well, and that's, but that's also why I found Ralph Moore so intriguing because a lot of them are small, but there are others that are, 8,000 people. And the reason is because Ralph let those people be who they were. He didn't say that this is, you can only, Paul, you can only start a small church because we start small churches. Yeah. He took the time to understand you. And then once he understood you and he just kind of let you, let you fly. And it's, it's, it's messy that way. It's, yeah. But relationships, are messy, but we've tried so hard to put church in this 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 framework to protect it, right? To where it's like, okay, go to seminary for a really long time, and then you go through all these these interviews and you do all this stuff, and then now you can you know associate pastor and now, but it's like, yeah, but pastors are still banging their kids ministry directors. So yeah, it's not like we solved the problem with twenty years of school. No. So right. it's it's messy one way or the other, 
But the brilliance, I think, in what he did was allowing people to be who they were and encouraging that and then letting them fly. And I think that was why people were so attracted to what he was doing and who he was. So circling that into the title for this discussion, What Matters Now, the thing that matters to each of us might have a common root and the fruit of it might be very different. And so you embark on a journey to, to co-author a book and that's a, ma- that's a message that really mattered to you. Mattered so much that you're going to put a lot of time and effort into it. Uh, many people find themselves in situations where they don't believe in a message strongly enough that they want to, that they feel like, you know, anybody could hear it or, or should hear it. They're not going to put that time and effort into it. Uh, how did you come about? What, what was it about this time or these circumstances or the relationships that you knew that this mattered now? Um, I, the reason that I write is because I want to figure out if I'm right or wrong in my assumptions. Like Mm -hmm. I, I, it's, I think the words heuristic, like heuristic writing is writing to discover, not writing from what I know. That's why I've only put out two books and two books that I've put out. It's all history because I'm trying to understand. I, I, with history, you understand patterns. If I can figure out what was and you see enough of what was, it allows you to really get perspective to what's happening rather than, you know, just what people are telling you is happening. So I think there's a part of it where for me, I saw, I even put this in the book. Um, you know, the, the book, I told you, it starts from this big vantage point of like movements, but then it goes down to even the base level of a personal story with a friend. Um, my best friend is, I'm, so I'm five, four and white. You can't tell on the screen, but I always warn people before they meet me. Cause first thing they, they say, like, I'm like, I had no idea. And so I'm like, shut up, dude. So now I'm just like, hey, by the way, I'm 5'4". Just calm down. Uh, but my best friend's 6'9 in black. So we just look <laughs> hilarious together. And we both, we both married tall, white, blonde, Swedish women. So <laughs> it worked out like our dream came true. So he, uh, he was playing D1 basketball at Morgan State University and gets diagnosed with leukemia. And so he's like, you know, he's trying to go to the league. And when we were growing up in high school, we, you know, like he said, he was a Christian, but the only real difference that I saw at the time was like his Sundays and Wednesdays sucked way more than mine did. Like, Cause he was, you know, he was in, he's in black church where he was there all day on oh, Sunday. Wow. So I'm like, yeah, have fun, dude, being a Christian. Um, <clears throat> but then he, when he got diagnosed with leukemia, like I'll, I remember one phone call. I was coming home from work. I was working for my dad's company at the time and I was just angry. I was just mad at the world. And I call Anthony to check on him, see how he's doing. And he's in the hospital. His dreams are shattered. You know, he is, he is leukemia. He's you know, the dude, I think he actually died. Like his heart stopped beating two or three times. I mean, he went through it, bone marrow transplants, all of it. And I called him. And I'm like, how you doing, man? He's like, oh, I'm good. How are you? And I just start whining. And then finally, I'm like, what am I doing? And I just start asking how he's doing, like trying to actually dig in. He's, he's just grateful for his life. And I'm like, huh? Like I would get off the phone with him confused. Like he had something I didn't have. Mm-hmm. So at the greatest point of suffering, I watched what faith actually was. I watched somebody that knew Jesus that put his attention on, if you ever read the book, you'll see there's the story of this little girl that he was investing in um, during this whole time and just became friends with this little girl because he's in the leukemia like section, he's six, nine. So when I first went to visit him in the hospital, they only had kids beds. Like it's a leukemia is typically a children's situation. And his, so his feet were (laughs) hanging off the bed like that far. So he was just making friends with all the little kids, but I got to see his faith in action. So back to your question. um, I wanted one, the history just to dig in and understand, but two, 
uh, I think the other part of this was like, I saw somebody at the pinnacle of what suffering was and I watched them walk through it in a way that I never could have. And then if you fast forward to, I think Paul knows this, I'll spare you the whole story. But um, in 2021, after we sold all our stuff and passed the church off and bought a fifth wheel to renovate, my brother was murdered um, and back in Maryland. So my brother was killed. His wife was shot and killed. And then my 10-year-old nephew was shot three times. And in that moment, like all those last 10 years of walking with Jesus came to a head. Because I had this peace that week that it made zero sense to me. It was what, two and a half years ago. It made zero sense to me. And I actually had a marathon scheduled uh, that Saturday, which was actually, I got the hat the following year. Because now every, uh, like every year on that week, I run a marathon. So that's, that's I got the hat. Um, it, but that year, I had one already scheduled. He was killed on, I think it was a Monday. And I found out Tuesday morning, ran the marathon. We had written a sermon on forgiveness for our network of churches months ago that was scheduled that Sunday. And I preached that Sunday. I wasn't scheduled to, but I ended up doing it. And like a month later, I'm reading back through my journals, reading back through journal entries. And I see 5.30 a.m. May 9th. Fragile was the title of the journal entry. And I had this whole beginning of the journal entry where I'm just whining about how fragile the RV is. I'm like, what am I doing? I'm moving my wife and my kid. I think I just found out she was pregnant for the second time. And like, I'm moving us into a freaking cardboard box. And I don't even know why we're doing it. I feel like we're following God, but I don't even know. He hasn't told me what we're doing yet. I felt like an idiot. So I'm whining in this journal entry. But then I was like, well, I guess if I'm honest, the rest of my life is just as fragile as this fifth wheel. And I start naming all the people I could lose. I could lose my wife tomorrow. I could lose my... And like, okay, well, I can't control any of that, but what can I do? Well, I guess I can learn carpentry and stop whining about the RV. I guess I can love my wife like I'll never see her again. And then I wrote out this prayer and I said, thank you for insight. Thank you for peace. 5.30 a.m. May 9th, my brother was murdered. <laughs> 10.30 p.m. May 9th. He prepared me that day. And I had no idea why I had that peace and didn't realize it until a month later. So for me, it's like we're in a society that's going through all this crap and people don't know how to handle it. So they're like, ah, TikTok, <laughs> you know, or they're just following, but it's like scripture access to the Holy spirit. Like we have everything we need because I, no therapist, no theologian, no person period could have prepared me for what was about to happen that night. Mm. Nobody. So it's like the only thing that we have to do is John 15. I got to connect people to the vine. It's, that's evangelism. It's, it's connection to the vine and letting him do what he does. So I think that was what it was that, that kind of brought us to that idea is what brought us to knowing that this is for me, there's nothing else to do. Talk about D it's like, this is, this is who we are. Mm. You know, we were, I think it was our last episode. We came to this this quote: "When's the best time to plant a tree?" The answer is twenty years ago. When's the next best time? Right now. Yeah. And in it's and it strikes me in your in your story there that so many times I'll speak for myself. So many times in my life, I have felt. Hey, I should do something. I should say something. I should, you know, put a book out there. I should write something. I should give a speech, whatever it is. And then the next step typically is like, eh, is it worth it? Eh, is it really what I want to say? Eh, is it right? And, and the, the critic, which is there to sometimes is there sometimes rightfully. So to enhance, to say, Hey, it's not ready. Yet. Like, don't put it out there, dude. Like, you know, get it together that critic then becomes a hindrance to me. And I go, ah, that's, it's not worth talking about. Mm -hmm. And it strikes me that the, sometimes these, these seemingly benign or repetitious things that we just go through, like, Hey, you need to, you had to have, you had to have a sermon and you planned it out and you, right. Was all preparation. It all mattered. It didn't, we didn't even know how much it mattered 
at the moment. And this idea of what matters now, if we are, if we have in our hearts, I think the desire to what you're talking about, spread a message, connect people to Christ, we can have that desire and that's, that's super important. And yet nothing, nothing and no one is greater than God's desire to move through his people in, in ways that, that, that will, we will experience how much that moment mattered and how much that message mattered 20 years in the future. And then we'll go like, oh man, I didn't realize how important that was. I was just doing my thing. I was just following through. Yeah. Uh, and, and yet, um, I love, I, th- I love the search. I, you talk about develop, you know, running through history and figuring out, you know, what, what happened and why it happened. And, you know, I love the search that we are on the, that we are, we, we know a destination and yet we are invited into the journey. And the journey is one of discovery of highs and lows of a hat that represents suffering of death, of wondering, pondering, of experiencing peace. The, I, 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 I wonder if part of our, part of our blessing, not our curse, part of our blessing is the journey that we get to have together of discovery, of just living and experiencing the life that we have and then and and being like okay well now now folks what do you, what do you want to do with this and do it and you have no idea how much it might matter absolutely i'm thinking now of the um what i learned about discipleship and evangelism prior to christianity because believe it or not it's not a christian concept It's a Jewish one. They just adapted it, right? And their whole philosophy was uh, you imitate the person, you know, the the master and apprentice model. You imitate the rabbi you follow, which is the experience that these 12 Jewish guys went through with their Jewish rabbi. But the way it evolved was that most people who initially flocked to it disappeared eventually. Very few people retained. And, that, and those few who, who, who stuck around were meant to because it was the right time. Because the message that mattered in the moment really mattered to them. And then later on, there were others for whom it mattered equally, even, even more so in some cases. But right at that moment it, it it matters to some people and not to others and we don't really get to know who that is without going through the process ourselves and so the approach the bullhorn approach <clears throat> is ineffective the mass baptisms for their own sake and i don't want to you know write them off wholesale. I'm just saying, you know, there's plenty of examples. I'm sure you've seen it, Curtis, of people who go through that and then eventually, the, and, and then it doesn't stick. Because we're not getting personal enough. We're not getting detailed enough about people's lives and we're not understanding what it is that makes them tick. This, But this approach of being benign and benevolent and and kind and generous and all of that, but, but, but not necessarily trying to force the issue until the right time is, I think is the message that matters where you're headed. Honestly, I think that if I was to put words to it and I'm of course, no expert on the Swedish culture and, um, my bride is, a. Swedish descent and lived in Sweden several years ago, but that was Sweden then. This is Sweden now. Uh, I would just say, though, that I think the 
the common thing that I see that that you, that you do need to hang on to would be um, courtesy, benevolence, and uh, and sincerity in everything you do. But the longer game of winning winning people back to the kingdom, the message that matters there is at the right time, you know. Uh, even if you know, even if you do get some initial inquiry, it may not be, it may be very non-committal, and you have to be prepared for that. You have to be prepared for a farm, the life of a farmer here, a long, long-term farmer. Um, that's going to be patiently waiting as the crops stay underground for several months, and then little shoots come up, but you can't pick them yet because they're not ready. And then you wait, and you wait, and you wait until the harvest time. And well, not surprisingly, look how much farming language Jesus used around it. I, I that, think that's what comes to my mind. The idea of, you know, one person is planting what or one person's sowing and the sowers, you, the sower is not there to be like, well, this ground's too hard. This ground's too soft. This ground's just right. <laughs> you know, you just sow <laughs> and, and because you're not in charge of the ground, you have, yeah. you don't even know, <laughs> you know, and then another person waters and another person care, takes care and then another person's going to harvest and each of those individuals could be could be in some ways the same you know the same person at times but we we play a part in a in a grander story uh in a in a grander process that is that extends far beyond each of us as individuals and the and extends beyond the end of our lives as well. We have no yeah. idea how far, uh, how meaningful the things that we have lived out are to somebody else. And if no, but if we don't tell anybody, it dies with you. Yeah. Wasn't it Les Brown? He always he had so much good stuff, but he had that whole talk. He was like the wealthiest place in the world isn't he named all the different places that it's the graveyard because there was the books never written there was the sermons never preached there was the ah that dude was good you ever listen to les brown oh yeah <laughs> god dude he make you run through a wall he powerful so powerful good. speaker oh, he was so good man. <laughs> he was fun yeah well that gets i think it does it, it's just evidence that some people have certain gifts there is the gift of a les brown who's going to stand in front of an audience of tens of thousands of people and he's going to move that audience in a very short period of time and then there's going to be somebody who uh john piper was a you know pastor who i followed for many years and super meaningful to me uh in my spiritual development 20 something years ago and took like eight years or something like that to preach the romans mm -hmm. <laughs> i mean that's some staying power and yep. got in deep with generations of people for many years in one church and that those two types of personalities those two types of individuals one is not more right than the other they are both necessary and they both play their part in the way that they could hmm. to spread the message that mattered to them in the way that they felt they should and both of them are messy <laughs> yeah. there's no there's no uh there's no perfect process and i think i think um the other thing that comes to my mind is this idea of this matter of hope because in our effort to communicate the message as best as we can we we as individuals maybe you folks are different but we as individuals tend to want to get things right and when they don't look right, when the evidence is it doesn't look right, we go, ah, we didn't do it. Or, you know, we say all sorts of things like God is trying to and things that aren't even biblical and make no sense. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. God doesn't try. He's doing or he's not like <laughs> relax. Mm -hmm. um, and and I and it's if if any of us could get it all right. Each one of us would be like, thank you very much. I did it. 
I will accept the congratulations now and you can all follow my lead, right? And none of us are allowed to do that. None of us, because of the grace of God, will be put into a position for, for long <laughs> where we can do that because, uh, because it's always to God, right? From him, through him, to him, never, oh, and by the way, you in the middle. No. <laughs> it never says that. <laughs> And that's that I think is um, that I think is a bit of hope for folks when we, when we encounter maybe a message that we think we should spread message we're, we're having difficulty spreading life gets all sorts of crazy town on us we feel like we've screwed it all up you, you don't you're not the linchpin holding this thing together <laughs> relax <laughs> no absolutely just do what you're called to do and spread the message you're called to spread in the time and in the context that you're given to do it and uh, leave the rest in the hands of the one who knows what to do with all the other times and eras and contexts. And uh, that's certainly proved enough for me. Uh, and I have enjoyed uh, breaking bread and, and, and digging into this Curtis uh, your book, uh, the E word. Where should we send people? Where should we direct them if they want to learn more about you or pick up a copy of this or your other book? Um, uh, they're both linked on uh, my website, curtishoneycut.com. Um, they're both on Amazon. If you just search my name on there, they'll both pop up. Um, yeah, it's easy enough. All right. Well, pick up your copy uh, of the E word today. Check out Curtis's website, curtishoneycut.com. Uh, we've got the spelling there on the screen for you. It's a little irregular. Uh, you from actually how got it how right, dude. Great it. job. I send it to people all the time, and they still get it wrong. Smarter than I look. Yeah, it's just <laughs> copy and paste. Come on, people. <laughs> but we've had a great time digging into this with Curtis on the Emissary Authors Podcast, where we interview uh, faith-driven founders, entrepreneurs, and leaders who are invested in spreading messages that matter. My name is Paul Edwards. Jason Todd is my co-host. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.